Hello, folks. Not a stick up. Not a stick up. Don't run. Don't run. It's not a stick up. Not a stick up. Uh, as you all know, we are. We adhere to First Timothy chapter two as it relates to uh, women uh, not having authority nor teaching a man. So, uh, for any gentleman that may be listening, any man that may be listening today, uh, we want to let you know, Sister Patsy Gaddison's uh, lesson today, the Word of God that she's going to be teaching, is going to be directed to the women of our church or to women that are listening. We're not saying that you can't listen. But we just want to observe the fact that the scripture is teaching what we are just trying to always to be structured in, always to observe and to do it that way. So I would that you all would receive our wonderful teacher for today in the person of past sister uh, uh, teacher, Patsy Gaddison, who is going to share with us the word of God. Oh my goodness. Thank you, Pastor Skinner. Thank you, ladies. Uh, this is... New, different, different kind of shoes. But all good because it's always God. It's always about God. So, again, um, we should always teach to an audience of one. So, whether or not there are five or 50, I'm still teaching as unto God. So, again, so I want to thank you for being here today. And for those of you that are out there, thank you for listening in. Um, and we probably. Um, we'll just go ahead and, and jump into the lesson because I guess at some point you can just play it again. All right, so today we're looking, well, let, hold on. Father God, uh, thank you, Lord, for being an all-wise, all-knowing, and all-loving God. Lord, you knew even before I was born I'd be standing here today on the World Wide Web, Facebook. So, Lord, we say, I say thank you. Lord, thank you again just for the opportunity to be able to breathe, Father, in the midst of all that's going on, uh, people that are being infected by this coronavirus. Lord, I say thank you. We all say thank you, Father God, for your grace and your mercy towards us up to this point. So, Lord, we just say thank you for this time that we're going to spend together. Lord, I pray that you stand and sit me down, Father God. You speak. Use my mouth, Father God, to speak into your word today, Father God, to the ladies that are here so, Father, we pray for open ears and open hearts, Father God, to be able to hear what it is that you're going to say to us today. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, I pray. Okay. Thank you, ladies, again. So, we're um, really continuing the lesson that we started, I guess, two weeks ago. We, we missed two Sundays. So, two weeks ago, we were talking about imperatives for Christian living. And I was trying to get to, verse, to 1 Peter 5, verses 5 through 11. But if you recall, two weeks ago, I mentioned the lesson was kind of hijacked by the Holy Spirit, and we ended up talking about 1 Peter 1 through 4, if you recall that, and we were admonished or encouraged, or Peter was admonishing us, encouraging us to pray for our elder, and we talked about that on last week, uh, or two weeks ago, and uh, Sister Julia, you know, really led us to the throne of grace uh, to cover our pastor and the leaders of our church, and I want to say to those of you that took the challenge to call your deacon to say thank you, I appreciate your efforts, and to those of you that we want to always to continue to pray for them in the same manner. So on today, we're going to go ahead and finish up our lesson, Imperatives for Christian Living, and this, so we're going to call this part two, 1 Peter 5, uh, 5 through 11. So I guess I want to start off with society often judges the parents by their children. Notice that? Um, and, and I think about when Patrice leaves the house now, I'm like, girl, remember who you represent. Now, in my mind, I'm thinking it's the Lord Jesus, right? But in the back somewhere, Judy, I'm like, girl, don't you make me shame. Yeah. Don't you go out there and say something you don't have no business or do something you don't have no business. That's how society judges the parents. Now, it's, it, and, and it judges them unfairly because now I've taught her what I've been taught. I've taught her the word of God. She knows right from wrong, but yet when she, if she makes a decision that is contrary to what the word says, y'all would look at me like, what's she teaching that girl? So same thing. So likewise, as a child of God, right, if we live a life of worry and a life of fear, that doesn't the world then have reason to believe that our father doesn't care for us? That our father is not as good as, as we say he is? 
if we don't represent him to be the good father that he is. So today, again, we're going to finish up on 1 Peter 5. So if you turn to 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 through 11, we're going to look at three imperatives for Christian living. Uh, and again, that in, in these imperatives will line us up to show the awesome father that we do have. So let's see. I don't know if you guys so you can read. So uh, let's go, and so, and again, so my first point under imperatives for Christian living is one, we must live as an humble servant. And let me back up, you have a new handout, so those of you that received the handout two weeks ago, you will need to print or get the new one. It's a little shorter, but same information. So hopefully you've all got your handouts in front of you. I'm sorry, I did not mention that. So point one is live as an humble servant. See, Anna, can you read, stand and read loud enough for us, please? We're, let's read just five, five through seven. Thank you, C. Peter had already admonished the, dis the, the dispersed church in chapter 2 to be submissive to their governmental authorities. And then uh, also in chapter 2, he addressed the slaves to be submissive to their masters. And then in chapter 3, he submits the wives to be submissive to their husbands. So when we get to chapter 5 here, we rem remember in verses 1 through 4, we uh, Peter admonish the elders to be caring for the flock. Remember, we even had a little pop quiz with the uh, outline on, la on two weeks ago as well. So and I do want to tell you the winner of the outline was Sister Chantel Dunham. She got her, yes, and she even wrote down the challenge question, so I was really impressed by the note-taking that she did. So Chantel and, and Chantel won a $10 e-gift card, so y'all might want to participate when we had these little challenges. So again, the my, the outline was the role model. Peter was the role model. Then he shared with us, the elders, the responsibilities that the elders have, which is to feed and to lead the flock. And then the last point was that the reward, where if they taught according to the word of God and they served the, the sheep well, that they would be rewarded in the end. So this is what we talked about on, on verse, in verses 1 through 4. See, now Peter shifts to encouraging the shepherd from encouraging the shepherd to encouraging the sheep to be submissive to the shepherd. He also commands that all believers would submit to each other. Now, I said the young believers were to submit to the elders, and not just because of age, because, but because of their spiritual maturity. Now, we know not every silver saint is a mature Christian. I hate to say that, but not a good shepherd, all of, all of us. Because we know that the quantity of years is no guarantee for the quality of experience, correct? Now, this also does not suggest that the elders should just run the church and never listen to the millennials, who always have lots to say, lots to add. So to avoid a generational war, <coughs> where the, the older members resist the younger members, and the younger members resisting the older members, the answer is that all should be submissive to each other. Now, it says uh, we should be clothed with humility, is what the, the scripture says. Now, the Greek translation for clothed is like an apron. And you think back to servants where they uh, would put an apron over their regular clothes to signify that they were ready for service. So this is what it was re referring to. So you want to put on humility as your clothing. It says, uh, then, then to let, we should let our minds and our behaviors be adorned with humility because this is the most beautiful garment that we can wear. So nothing that we can buy, no designer outfit would be better fitted or look better on you than humility does. And it says, now how, um, you say, so what does humility look like? You know, so what, what do I put on? You put on the willingness to perform the lowliest and the littlest task for Jesus' sake. So are you willing to clean the church? And I'm just naming, you know, are you willing to go and serve the, the sick or to bring food to somebody who's 
who is, has COVID and can't go out, are you willing to go out of your way to pick up some groceries, to leave it on their doorstep? Are you, you know, what are, are you willing to do the lowest, lowest, low sorry, or the littlest services? How about consciousness of your own inability to do things apart from God? To know that nothing you do is on your own strength. Humility. How about the willingness to be ignored of men? That I'm going to stand here, or I'm going to do whatever, or I'm going to clean the church, but I don't have to call Sienna and Judy and let them know that I clean the church. I don't have to let y'all know that I'm going to bring food to somebody that can't do for themselves. So that's how about that? That's humility. Or being other-centered and not self-centered. It's not always I, I, I. It needs to be you and doing for others. So that's what humility looks like. And then, uh, remember, we have the, the perfect example of what humility looks like. Remember when Jesus laid aside his outer garment and put on a towel? And what did he do? Wash the disciples' feet? That's humility. So, again, we've got the perfect example. And, look, and true humility is not demeaning ourselves. It's not self-hating or thinking poorly of ourselves. It is simply not thinking of ourselves at all. Simply not thinking of ourselves at all. Then that's tough for us. So actually you would call that self-forgetfulness. I guess I made up a word. Self-forgetfulness. So it's not about you at all. Now look, and it takes grace to submit to another believer. But God can give us that grace if we humble ourselves before him. Peter reminds us that God hates, he resists. The, the, the sin of pride. It was pride that turned the beautiful, angelic Lucifer, right, into a devouring Satan, right? It was pride, the desire to be like God, that stirred Eve to take the forbidden fruit, remember? And then when I started thinking, it was even pride that caused us, caused for the need of clothing. Because they sinned, they were naked in the garden and everything was good, right? Because of pride, now they need clothing, So clothing was the original badge of man's sin and shame. And I thought about that. I was like, wow. So all this money we put into trying to look good and trying to match and all of this, and it was really a badge of shame. Because had they obeyed, we'd still be walking around and not have the need for clothes and not be ashamed and not even know we're not wearing clothes. Anyway, that was just a little side, and I thought, wow. So, okay, the pride of life is evidence of worldliness. The only antidote to pride is the grace of God, his unmerited favor towards us. And we receive that grace when we yield ourselves to him. And then the evidence of that grace is that we yield to one another. But again, that's not easy to do. And you'll never do it. You'll never be submissive. We will never be submissive. Let me include myself. We will never be submissive to others if we don't go to point B, to be submissive to our Savior. So I'm sorry, so I, and actually I missed A, so that, that I just talked about being submissive to your superiors where we're uh, in line with what God tells us to do with those that are, in, that are in charge or those in authority above us. So we want to make sure that we are submissive to our superiors. And then now, but again, we will not be submissive to each other if we are not first submissive to our Savior. So that's B. So she read 6 and 7, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he... In, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Okay? Now, submission is an act of faith under the mighty hand of God as he directs our lives, plain and simple. But the key here is that phrase, those three little words, in due time, in his perfect time. God never exalts anyone or lifts his hand until that person is matured in that area. So regardless of how long it takes for me, regardless of how long it takes for you, God's not going to release you from the the suffering until you've learned or matured in that area. So it's first the cross and then the crown. First the suffering and then the glory. Now that that, that doesn't sit well with us because, see, look, that's even hard to say. You want me to... Suffer, you want me to carry the cross, and then I get the crown? Yes. It's just, so, because remember, Moses was under the mighty hand of God for almost 40 years. Remember? When, when, before God lifted his hand and sent him to deliver the Israelites from Egypt. And remember Joseph? 
He was under the mighty hand of God for almost 13 years before God lifted him from the pit to the palace. So, and, and we've got lots of other examples that we could use, especially for ourselves, because you're possibly in, under the mighty hand of God now. So I said, now, in the evidence of, in, in the evidence of our pride, because we talked about pride earlier, about not being submissive, the evidence of our pride is our impatience with God. Yeah, I said it. We get impatient with God. Because if I get impatient with you just because you made me wait 15 minutes outside and God has me in this whatever I'm in for 15 years, we get impatient with God. And one reason we find ourselves suffering under the mighty hand of God is that he's trying to teach us patience. And we're like, mmm. And if you were in the last women's ministry meeting we had, we talked about patience. The word here is the Greek word hypomeno. Hypo meaning under and meno meaning remain. So it's to remain under pressure. And we're not trying to have that. We, we're not, we, so as soon as we see some suffering, as soon as we look like trouble's coming, the first thing we have, how long? You're not even in it. How long will be in there? How long is it going to last? And why me? Why, why this? So that's what he's teaching you patience. Ah, y'all, I'm stepping on my own toes here. Cause, yeah. uh, so, and, he, and you say, you ask how long? God again says, in due time. So in due time, that does not say six months, does not say six days, does not say, it just says in due time, in his perfect timing. And then say, now if you get antsy, because see, some of us, you know, we want to take things into our own control. It says if we get antsy and we try to exalt ourselves, Peter then reminds us of the master's word, for all who exalt themselves will be what? Humbled. And for those who humble themselves will be exalted. See, we have issues with, we got it backwards, because if we're not in control, it's just not right. But in a, the women's ministry lesson, we were uh, reminded that patience is the settled reality that we are not in control. Told you, it's not a debate. It's not whether or not, well, Lord, you're going to let me be in control. No, no, no. It's the settled reality that we are just simply not in control. We have it all backwards. I told you, we, we want things to come when we want it, and we get it, and then we don't know what to do with it. <laughs> then we, we're, we're trampled with it, right? But it says, the thought of the omnipotent hand of God should make us humble and submissive to him, in all that he brings to us. Because we know that whatever he brings to us is to, is to make us better. Everything we go through is to make us better. In the area that you're lacking in. Because see, I'll be too busy looking at somebody else and what they're going through and think, well, okay, well, that wasn't long for her. Didn't seem long to me for her, yeah. right? Yeah. But in God's due time, it's to make us better. It's to make us better. A more make make us glorify him more that's what he and because he loves us enough he wants us to come to him so he does put his hand on us to make us humble to make us patient okay a great benefit of submitting humbly before god is the privilege the confident reliance that of him handling our anxieties and of him handling our burdens but not unless we meet the conditions we just read about in 5 and 6, where it says we've got to be submissive and we've got to be humble. Only then can we claim the wonderful promise of God caring for us. Yes, now, in the midst of the pandemic, y'all, we've been in about 14 weeks now. Now, we back on stay at home, extended to like August 26, I think I heard yesterday, August 20-something-something. Something. Uh, wearing mandatory masks now, the social unrest. God's hand is on us, but he just wants us to run to him. He's humbling us, and again, but we're too busy. We can't even bask in what he's doing in our lives because we're too busy asking how long. So every time they give us a date, we're like, okay, I can hold out till August 26th. Then when they're going to move it to September 15th, you're like, how long? How about we appreciate what he's doing for us now? How about we appreciate that, again, today we're breathing, that today we're able to go out on our own, that we're not sick, shut in, that we're, not, that we're able to move on our own. 
So again, he has us here, and it's not as if he's forgotten us. It's not God put Corona out here and they say, oh, well, okay, now he's forgotten. It's like, oh, I guess I need to, no. He's got his hand on us because he wants us to honor him in everything we say and do, even in the midst of when it doesn't look right or it doesn't feel right, because they say this is the new normal. A new normal? Because say, what if we never go back to being able to go to a store without a mask? Are we going to stop praising him? What if we're never able to go into a building, you know, and, and you are, and things, things become cashless and you can't touch anything? And what? Do we stop praising him then? Absolutely not. You praise him more. Thank you, C. Thank you. No, but look, because look, cause if we are ain't too anxious and too worried, and if we stay there too long, we will miss God's blessing. And then we become poor witnesses to those who are lost. Because remember my illustration at the beginning? The kid, Patrice, goes out, represent me well. Now, we're supposed to be representing God well in everything. So he didn't say when there's no corona. He said, represent me well. So that means in the midst of everything going on, we ought to, all, you know, we ought to really be shining like peacocks now for it. We ought to really be showing the world because, again, they know how to, well, we know how to complain too, but because we know better, we should be in the marketplace not complaining. We should be walking in with our mask proudly because they've asked us to. And, and again, it, it's not for, it, you're taking care of yourself. You're taking care of others. So you should be doing it because, because you want to, because there's the, this is my part to participate in right now. So, again, so we got to get to the point where we stop complaining so much that we are able to, just see God for what he's doing in our individual lives. Because although corona has us all locked down in our, well, in our perspective places, it's for different reasons. I might need to work on my, well, no, I need to work on my patience. Not I'm, I'm, I need to work on my patience. Because remember, I told y'all, it's just two in my house, and we're struggling some days. You know, most days we good, but like I say, it was cute the first, you know, two weeks. You know, we did some little TikToks, and we, you know, we had some fun. You know, then that, no, week four came around, and you're like, okay, well, we'll do another TikTok. You know, and then, you know, week eight came around, and we're like, okay, I'm, I'm tired of ticking and talking now. I'm, I'm, I'm tired. I'm, I'm, and, and, you know, now we didn't got this, you know, day or two, we didn't even talk because we, we just, just, so what is he teaching me? For me, it's work on your patience. And I'm going to leave you in that house, stay safe, well, it ain't work, stay safe, whatever you do at home, until you get it right. Exactly. So that's, that's my struggle. So I know your struggles would be different. So he's like, but until we can learn to, to appreciate God, to thank God in the midst of, and my thing is if we thank him enough and got so busy thanking him and praising him and worshiping him and doing for others and not for ourselves, we won't even know. That we're in the 16th, 17th, 18th, 25th week. But we're too busy watching the clock. If we get busy working for God, we won't watch the clock. Oh, Lord, I don't even know where that, okay, all right. So look, so again, we, we don't want to miss out on God's blessing in the midst of this. We don't want to be poor witnesses. We don't want to be like the kid that's doing their own thing and they're like, but your father was the heavenly father and, and that's how you acting in the midst of... We want to represent our Father well, and let's, and to, to uh, triumph in the trial, and to, we want to bring glory to his name. And then the word also says that we should cast our cares upon him. And look, cast here is an energetic verb, sister teacher over there. So it, it's energetic. So it says cast. So it does not say lay your care upon him. It says throw. And see, back, and I was looking, I said throw, and I looked up the, the Greek word means to, to throw. And I thought, that's not how we used to say that, Sienna. When I was a baby, we didn't, when I was young, we didn't know nothing about no throw. That was a fancy word. We used to say chunk it. Y'all remember this? Chunk, chunk it. And you're like, what's, and that, that, that's how we knew. Because look, because if you got some issues, some problems in your life, so whether it's financial issues, it might be your family, it might be, you know, work. It just, just could be your money. It could, could be all kind of things. But it, again, the word says to cast our cares upon him. Because if it had said lay, I could put it down here. I don't know if y'all can see that, but you could put it down. But because I'm laying it, my hand's still on it. 
See, and then because I'm so intellectual and I'm so smart, you know, that's how we say, because I'm so smart. Now, now it might have been about my child, but Lord, you know what? If, if I buy her this one more thing, she'll get it right. You know, my husband's not getting, oh, but you know, if, if I do this one more thing, because see, I'm laying it and I've got my hands on it. Oh, you know, but if I, if I do this, may, maybe, if, maybe if I do my hair better, he'll, he'll you know, he, maybe, you know, that, or, you know, or my finances, you know, may, maybe if I invest in these stocks over here, because see, my hand's still on it. But that's not what it says. Word says to cast. So I got to, ah. Oh. Now, I, it, it ain't nothing for me to lay on. It ain't nothing for me to pull back. Because if you give it to him, you got to give it to him wholeheartedly. And when you give it to him wholeheartedly, it's no taking it back. So again, so, it's, so stop laying your cares before God and cast it to him. Because when you cast it to him, he's got it in control. We, we sing today, he's my everything. You got to know he's your everything. So when you, whatever it is, your finances, your children, whatever it is, when you put it before God, you got to cast it to him. Give it to him. Stop laying it. I've been laying some things. And I laid it and I picked it back up. And I caressed that thing, and I tried to change the color of it because I thought that would make it better. He said, no. Listen, reminded me, you got to cast it. You got to throw it. So it's like you go to the bank, you make a deposit. It's a deposit with you. You deposit, you don't go right back and take that thing out because if you got, there's a process, right? But when you deposit, you like, and you know that it's well taken care of because they, they have FDIC laws. They have the money you put up, what, up to like $10,000 or so, 100 or whatever. I can't remember. So you put your money in, and you know you secure it. How much more security do we have in giving things to the Lord God, I, the one who created us? How much more? Yeah, but we're going to trust the bank. We're going to trust man with our money, but we're not going to trust God with our issues. Yeah, we got it backwards. We got it backwards. We got it backwards. So we got to cast our cares, our past cares. So we got some stuff we still worry about from 1963. That was the year I was born, y'all. 1963. We still dealing with that because mom and them was dealing with it, so we dealing with it. We dealing with the stuff present. You know, it's like, oh, Lord, how are we going to get through corona? How are we going to do this? How da, da, da. We worried about some stuff ain't even happened yet. But when it happened, Lord, I'm ready to worry. Cast. Yes, cast. Because, again, if we're not careful, it becomes your character. Then it's like I worry about everything just because that's what I do. Because whatever's going to come. So, again, it's not even happened yet. It's future, and we're already ready to worry. Y'all, we got to cast. Stop laying things. Charles Spurgeon says it best. Let me say it. He said, this work of casting can be so difficult that we need to use two hands. So I showed you. Throw it with two hands. The hand of prayer and the hand of faith. Prayer tells God what the care is. Isn't that awesome? And, and ask God for help. So, Lord, I, I, I need you to, you know, this. And it's not as if he doesn't know. But remember, he loves us so much, he lets us participate in this game called life. He allows us to be able to put our little two cents in so that you can say, Lord, I need this. Lord, I, I, I'm struggling here. And he's like, yeah, baby, I, you've been struggling. But then you just get, but again, if you're going to cast it to me, I'm ready to catch it. But if you're just going to play around with it and lay it, then, okay. He says, it, it, prayer is two things. You, prayer tells God what the care is and asks God for help. And in faith, believes that God can and he will do it. See, because my struggle is not that I believe he can't do it. It's be, will he do it. And that's because, well, I might have said something to somebody and now I'm like, no, he ain't going to do it for me because it, God is not a fickle God. God is an, a faithful God to his word and to his children. So, again, it's not, so you got to know that he can and he will. But, again, what you got to cast it, though. You got to cast it. Got to get rid of it. Because, again, the, uh, again, back to pride, you'd be a proud presumption to keep worries that God has already promised to take care of. And I said, what? I mean, God must really look at us like, oh, my God. I done told that, how, like your children, I done told that girl I was going to do that. I done told her I was going to deliver her from that. I done told her. And you still, you still play, laying with it. You, 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 you still rearranging it. I, exactly. You say, yes. So it's like, okay. So he's already given us some promises. We got to rely on him for, to, to deliver on his promise. And just, just, I had two scriptures here just for you to uh, 
to, to just help you easy ones to remember. Philippians 4, 6, we probably already have that all memorized. Do not be anxious for anything. It says, but in every situation, by what? We just talked about prayer and supplication, petitions, minds, with thanksgiving. What I told you earlier, in the midst of this pandemic, we should be thanking. If you thank him enough, you will lose track of time, I promise you. It says, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So again, as Charles Spurgeon said, that the, the prayer, that it's a two-hand. So you need the, the hand of prayer and the hand of faith. Prayer tells God what you need, and then faith believes that he will do what he says he will do. Plain and simple. So Philippians 4 and 6, and then we've got, uh, just don't worry, Luke 12 and 22. It says, then Jesus said to disciples, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, or what you will wear. So again, if we trust God who has made us promises, he said if I take care of a bird, and I don't know what's going on lately, uh, but in, in my few little runs out and about, there are these big black birds, and it's not the vulture, not them big, but it's, it's, it's almost blue black bird. I was supposed to look it up. And lately, they just everywhere. And, and, and animals and, and, and rep, well, not whatever, that's not what that's reptile, but flight, the birds, they, they just intrigue me lately because they're just not scared of anything. You know, we got these cats on my street. Now I ain't going to We got some cats on my street that they, they double dog dare me to drive down my street. Because they will not move until, I, anyway, but it back to the bird. So God would take care of the bird because th these birds, I, the last two days, there's these black blue birds that are kind of on, they were by a car in the parking lot. And I thought, oh, okay, I don't know what kind of bird that is. And I don't know if it's attacking because when I see a bird, I always think the movie, the birds, yes. Alfred Hitchcock, y'all, yeah, but some of y'all going to date you a little bit. But anyway, but this bird did not move, did not flutter. And that was the second one I passed this week. So, and I thought, in fact, the other one just intrigued me so much. He was between a car. I had to do one of them. That bird did not move. So if God is taking care of a bird, the bird even though not to be scared of me, if the Lord takes care of a bird and feeds him, and I don't know if he was waiting on food because one had his mouth wide, and because I'm standing like looking, what is this bird doing? Not afraid? Because his heavenly father who created him was going to feed him or whatever he was waiting on. And I thought, gosh, you know, we, but, but unlike the bird, didn't get flustered because I passed by, you know, and any, any little word you hear, you would get flustered. And oh my, oh my God, you know, oh, they're going to put a chip in our hand. You know, they're going to, oh my God, they're going to do this. Uh, yeah, I see, I read too much Facebook. See, that's why I don't like Facebook. Sorry, Facebook. I get out there and then y'all terrify me all these things we be talking about. I'm like, nah, let me stick to the word. Let me just stick to the word. Anyway, so again, so we got the, the two uh, scriptures. So Philippians 4 and 6 just says for us to be carefree. And Luke 12 and 22 tells us not to worry. Now, just getting back to listen on Peter. Now, if anybody knew of the experience that, uh, or knew from experience that God cares for his own, it was Peter. Because when you read the four Gospels, you see Peter shared in some wonderful miracles where his faith was increased and just kind of built from one, one uh, situation to the next, which is what God is trying to do for us. I mean, if you look back, so you think back 10 years from now, I pray that your faith now is stronger than it was 10 years. So maybe you hadn't had anybody sick and died, and may, or maybe, but, but now you have. You look back now and you're like, oh, now you're able to go and sit with somebody else, that you're able to go and take care of somebody else because you've had the experience with yours. So you, you're building faith. So every time he brings you out of something, that's an added chunk of faith. So I keep saying, I'm building my little blocks, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm sending, sending them my timbers, building my blocks. So it's like, okay, if, I'm, if he brought me from this, so when I get over here and there's something else, I'm like, well, if he brought me through that one, boy, he, he can bring me through this one. And then it's like, okay, then I get through that one. And then, okay, so, you know, so if he brought me through those two, okay, he can bring me through three. So you're building a relationship. So, again, but you don't get that relationship without knowing his word, without being close and, and knowing his promises that he's given to us. So, again, if anybody knew about that, it would be Peter. Because, again, Jesus healed his mother-in-law, building some faith. Then he gave him a great catch of fish when he could get none, so building a faith. 
He helped him pay his temple taxes. And then it says he helped him walk on water. Now, and, and I love that one that, that, that it's put there because we know Peter had just a lack. So I thought that's life for us. Some days I have, oh, yes, I, my faith is high on a high level because I know he's going to do it. And then there's sometimes, and it's for a minute because, again, we know the end of the story. We know we will win in every battle. But sometimes when we're going through, it's hard to see. Things get, oh, like, right, I got a hair in my eye, and I, and I can't see too good, but you can't see well in the midst of it. But you know when I get to the other side. So we don't worry about the through. So I just figured that out. We don't worry about the through. So, again, so Peter, Peter had a, a lapse there a little bit, but, again, he, he came back to senses, right? Then uh, it, even, Jesus even helped him when he repaired the damaged ear. Remember, he cut the man's ear off. So, so just all of these miracles that Peter had a chance to experience for himself. And then even when uh, Peter was delivered from prison. Uh, so, but with each encounter, Peter knew that he had a loving and a caring father, just like we do. Now, we know that he loves us. We know that he has our best interests at heart. But at the same time, we get despondent when things happen and again it's okay to be there for a little while but you don't want to live there and again be a poor witness for those that are lost we are always God's shining star we're in a world of darkness right so if we're in darkness we ought to be shining so in the midst of this pandemic when things look dark now we really ought to be praising God we really ought to be shining through to let the world know that we have a true savior who will deliver us when in due time. Amen. Not until he says, in due time. Yes. That is on. Well, ladies, I th is that my time? I'm, I'm lost with the time. 10.58? Was it 10.15? Okay, let's, let's go ahead just do one more then. Uh, so on... So we looked at the imperatives for Christian living. Uh, the three points, number one, was live as an humble servant. And then, uh, again, we have to be submissive to our superiors and then be submissive to our Savior. And then the next imperative is to live as a watchful soldier. Uh, Sienna, would you read 8 and 9 for us, please, baby? Be sober and vigilant. Mm. That's it, yeah, eight and nine. Thank you, see. Uh, so again, so now we've got, we saw how to live as an humble servant, and now we want to live as a watchful soldier. Uh, now, we, we know, Revelation tells us that Satan will be bound for a thousand years, and that hasn't happened yet. So because he's not bound, he's still roaming around. And guess where he's roaming? At your house, and at my house, and at the neighbor's house who popped firecrackers until 3 o'clock this morning. And then it said, I wanted to be in self this morning. I thought, nah, if I was a firecracker popper, I should go and buy some, and I should wake them all up. You know, I'm trying to sleep, and they just pop it. I'm like, it's 3. It's not even the 4th anymore. But anyway, but <laughs> Satan is not bound. He is living probably next door to your houses, if not in your house. So we have to recognize him. That, that's, so we got to recognize the enemy. He is a pretender, and he is subtle, so we must practice self-control and be clear-headed. It's a vigilant, so, cl vigilant and sober and vigilant. is clear-headed and be watchful, suspicious of the constant danger from the enemy because he's always up to something. So we got to be on guard like a soldier. Now, last uh, in October, last, October 2019, it seems like moons ago since 20. So October last year, Patrice and I had an opportunity to go to Paris, France. It was a wonderful trip, wonderful place, wonderful, wonderful. Saw lots of great things there, you know, ate stuff that will never, and, you know, we like croissants here. You have not had a croissant until you go to a corner bakery in Paris and get a croissant straight out of the oven. Oh, my gosh. So I was like, okay, it's worth another trip just to go get another croissant, Judy. 
But we had a chance to go to Buckingham Palace, so we went to London, saw the Buckingham Palace. No, we didn't get a chance to see the Queen, although they told us that was the day she was gone. You know, we, we arranged our whole schedule, and then, of course, man planned, God displanned, as Pastor said. Uh, we didn't get a chance to see the Queen, but there were, we saw lots and lots of soldiers, though, and they were all uniformly dressed neatly, the red and black pants, and, you know, they had the they big helmet-looking thing with the little tassels on it, and it was cute. And then they had a big gun, and they carried these guns, and they, and you, you'd see them, and I, I don't know, I was trying to do the little time or whatever it was, but they, and then all of a sudden, all of them were just on, on beat, they'd all do whatever, they'd do the turn and da-da-da. They were on guard, protecting the royal family. And I'm pretty sure, you know, we've seen some accounts that if someone had gotten out of line, that they've been trained to put them back in line, right? So that's, what you, we've got to be on guard. So when Satan comes to us, we've got to be ready. We got to be armed with the word, which, I, which is our big gun, be armed with the word and ready to defend ourselves. Okay, now it says, uh, so again, so we got to be sober because he's a serpent and he deceives. And then because he comes as a roaring lion, he comes to devour. And that's the part. Now he says, now he, he because he, again, so he's here and he's here to devour. And it says the picture is of one that a beast swallowing a prey in one gulp. So I want you to understand, when it says devour, it's not saying Satan just here just to lick. Or to nibble. Just to kind of, you know, play with you, Sienna. Just, oh, I'm just messing with Sienna a little bit. He wants to devour you. Devour means to get rid of you permanently. That, that's his plan. That's his goal. That's all he, because remember, he, he's, he's, Satan, he, he's not happy with us. because he, he got kicked out and, and we then now we were created to worship God, and he was like, "Well, that was my role." But again, pride, remember? So in, in here, so we got he's like a roaring lion. Now he's roaring, but we got to remember he's been defamed at the cross. So he has he has no power of sort. But but the sound of his voice still is it, potent, and it still robs Christians of their effectiveness, which is what he's trying to do. So, oh, okay, look, ooh, oh, Sister Sienna sings. Oh, okay, she, and she edifies God in front of all of those people in the church. I'm going to, and I can't nibble at her because, again, she is edifying him in front of others who are causing them to edify God. So he can't nibble at you, see. He has to come for you full-fledged. He has to come with you with all he's got every time he comes, but you got to be ready with your gun, and you're ready to devour him. Ah, I said, okay, so, um, okay, Satan is an adversary, the devil, and he's the accuser, so he goes before God, and actually, he, <laughs> oh, I think I'm getting a little here, but I, I just, he actually goes before God and said, can I get her? Can I get at Sienna today? Can I get at April today? And Lord, yeah, she, yeah, she ready. Are we ready? Mm. Are we ready? It says, now, he is a serpent who can bite at any, at when we least expect it. So, see, we'll get so, care, so hung up on that we're singing in the choir, that we're teaching the Sunday school lesson. Oh, I'm, I'm above all. Mm, okay, all right. No, we've got to always be on guard like the soldier. We've got to recognize the enemy. Now, say he has power and intelligence and and, and when he can't get to you, he has a host of demons, see? So he goes, and, and who assist him in his attacks on God's people, the little imps. So when he can't get to you, he's like, oh, I'm, I'm going to send this one over here. Constantly on you to, again, to make your Christian uh, walk ineffective. And that, that's what he wants. Because, again, if you fall, then, you know, them in your house going to fall because you're like, well, is she? A? And then them and, you know, next door going to fall because you fail. See, that, that's, what, that's the, the tactic he has. So we've got to be careful that we are always on guard. Yeah. See, so it says we got to be sober, have our minds under control when it comes to our conflict with Satan. Satan, because look, now if he can't get you with something bad, he'll try something. You, you think, oh, I got this new job, you know, oh, I got this new 
He will dangle things in front of you that look like pure gold. And then once he gets you in it, then you can't get out of it. It's like, oh my gosh. So, so read somewhere it says trouble comes in on four legs, comes riding in on four legs, and then it walks out on two. Because it comes to you fast out of nowhere, but then it's going to take you a while to get out of it. So it says, so for us, uh, now he would, he would deceive us if it were not for the word of God. So we've got to have our word in us. We've got to be rooted and grounded in what the promises of God. Because the better we know God's word, the keener our spiritual senses will be to detect him at work. So we must be able to try the spirits and know the true from the false. So we've got to be able to uh, recognize Satan at his tricks to know that God has already made promises to us. So again, he's already told us that he would take, because remember the things that we cast? Say, say, oh, no, no, pick that. No, it's like I've cast that, and we, we got to remember that that's where we are, that our stand, that we are a child of God, and again, who we're representing. Okay, the, the next um, outline is, then as we live as a watchful soldier, we should also resist the enemy. Yes. Uh, Satan's desire is to get Christians to doubt, deny, disregard, and this last one, to disobey. We know what the word says. The word says love, love all. And we love all except them that don't look like me. I love those that live next door to me. I love those in my house, but yeah, I don't love that one over there because they, they didn't treat me right. That's not so... He wants us to disobey. So again, Satan will use any tactic to get us to go against the word of God and to, again, make us ineffective. Uh, but the secret to spiritual warfare is simple and steadfast. It's just resist him. We should take our stand on the word of God and refuse to be moved. That's what God desires of us. And Ephesians 6 and 10 instructs us to put on the whole armor of God so that we can stand against the wiles of the devil. Say so our weapons are the word of God and prayer. See, we, we got all we need. We just don't use the resources that we've got available to us. We've got the word. We know the word. But when Satan comes at us, it's, Pastor, would you, what am I supposed to, you, you got to fight him. So you got to resist him. Okay. Uh, let's see, where are we? So we got to resist Satan through our faith in God. And we should never try to fight him in our own way. We got to fight him with the word. Because see, he'll make a fool out of you. He'll make you think you know. Mm. See, we got to know the word that we can resist him the way Jesus did with the word of God. And Peter assures us that we are not the only ones going through this. So when you're thinking, man, it's always me. Why me? Why me? I say, well, one, why not you? Because you're my, God, you're my child. You're equipped. So we, but we are not the only ones facing. They're, they're, our brothers and sisters are facing the same trials. And that's why we got to pray for one another. We got to encourage one another in the word. We got to be able to be able to share. Sharing our personal victories will encourage others, while their victories will encourage us. But if we're so busy trying to be uh, secretive, I don't want you to know what I'm going through. Then you'll never help anybody else. And the sad part of that that you'll never get help from somebody else as well. Because maybe you come to me with this thing that you think is just far fetched. That it is, oh my gosh. And I'll be like, oh, something similar happened to me two years ago. And I was able to do this, and I was able to, to hang on to that. And then sometimes it's just some practical stuff. I was able to call these people. I was able to go here and got assistance. But because we want to be so, secret, so secretive, we've got to know that sharing our stories edifies one another. It encourages one another. So, again, if I'm standing, so as a teacher, bless our hearts, you know, we don't, Judy, we don't get to keep no secrets pretty much. You know, every, when you stand here and it's like, I'm not going to say that. And then my poor child, I thought, you, oh, I'm not going to say that. And before you know it, it doesn't like, oh, goodness. So, again, being transparent, but always in hope and prayer that is going to be something that you can relate to, that you can say, okay, I, I understand where she's coming from. Or, again, and if you're not going through it today, I'm like, Pastor Wilson, deep freeze it. It will come up again. It will come up again. So, again, we should not be afraid to be transparent in uh, our stories so that we can learn to recognize the enemy and then we can learn to resist him together. That we can, and, again, because if, I'm, if you tell me you're struggling with something, I'm like, you know what, I'll pray for you. 
And, know, and sometimes just knowing that Sienna is praying for me in that area, it was like, you know what, I, I, I can, okay, all right, all right, so I've got God on my side, got my sisters praying for me, and I've got this decision to make. It can make it a lot easier. So again, we need to be able to share better. Okay, now, and, and again, so again, we need to resist the enemy. Now, now Peter failed to, to heed the warning to recognize and resist the devil. He did. Uh, in Luke 22 and 31, the Lord told, says, uh, Simon, Simon, indeed, listen to y'all, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Just the thought of Satan going to God and asking for permission to mess with us and for God being able to say, yes, she's, she's, she's ready. Mm -hmm. She's my child. She's ready. She, she's my child. And you're like, no, I'm not ready, I'm not ready. And he's like, no, she's ready. He's like, mm-hmm, go. He said, but he wants to sift you as wheat. And I thought, you know, and I thought those sifter, that flour sifter thing, those little holes were really, really tiny. So I'm not, just like, okay, so he wants to sift you as wheat. So again, Satan's desire was not just to lick at Peter, not to just nibble at him. He wanted to devour him. Okay, and the, so again, so Peter resi uh, resisting the devil, Peter did not heed the word because on the night that Jesus was arrested, like I say, he wouldn't have gone to sleep had he heeded the word. Uh, he wouldn't have cut off Malchus's ear because he thought it was the end of the world. They were doing his Jesus wrong. And then he definitely, definitely would not have denied him three times. But again, did not resist the enemy. And again, we got to resist him because, again, he's coming to steal, kill, and to destroy uh, and, and notice the, the word here says resist the devil. And, and in scripture, it tells us to resist, I mean, to, to flee evil, you know, to, to shun the appearance of evil. But here it says to resist the devil because, and, and, say, and he will flee from you. So again, so we're not resisting, we're fleeing. And you're fleeing with the word of God because again, uh, the, we resist evil, but Satan we have to resist. And because resist is uh, the Greek word stand, and it's against. So you got to be more. So, so the, the, the picture here is that the more the Satan comes to you, pressing you, that you be praying more. You become more active in your prayer. You become more active in your, your, your devotionals. You're girding yourself up with the word. Now, it says when, when you talk about when we, uh, earlier when we talked about the sheep and the shepherd, it says then, then in this sense, you could almost see Satan as the, the, the sheep dog. The, the sheep get scattered about. The, you know, the, so you got the whole flock together, and you got one or two, and what does the dog do? The dog comes around, he'll bark at him, roof, roof. Satan, his attacks, and what, it, what, does, what does the sheep do? Run back to the fold. So that's, so if we learn to take Satan's tactics as just a reminder, I need to call on God. I need to go back to my word, check myself. Am I still in my devotionals? Am I still reading the word? Am I still praising God for good and bad? Am I still doing all those things? If you're still doing that, that's, so that's what Satan's attack should be like for us. When he's coming, okay I'm, a, okay, I'm off track a little bit. Let me get back on track. So he's the sheepdog that's going to hit his, because remember, his roar is the fang, so he can't really get at you, but he can make you think he can. He's trying to make you ineffective. So here, if we think of his tactics as a uh, reminder to go back to the word, to be encouraged by the word, to maybe come get closer contact with your sisters. What is your relationship like with your fellowship then? When you're being really tried, have I been going to women's meeting? Have I been going to Bible study? Have I been going to Sunday school trying to get the word it? So, so if, if we're doing that, we can use those tactics to our good. And that's all. And, and at the end of the day, who's glorified? God. God is glorified. So with that, ladies, I, I'm, we will sh close for today. Uh, I thank you for your uh, attentiveness, and I pray that you've been blessed by what has been said today. And again, because imperatives for Christian living, uh, we just can't live any kind of way and, and say that our father is a good father, that he loves us, and then we're crying on every, you know, and, and we're being defiant, and we don't want to follow the, the mandates of our city which they're doing the best they can. We talked about that in the first Peter, first Peter 1 through 4. They're making decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. So we got to be patient with them. Again, learn patience. We got to be patient with them and just trust God that 
trust God because he knows what he's doing. So I was going to say the rest of it, but trust God that he knows what he's doing. So, Father God, we thank you again for this time on today. Lord, we pray uh, for every woman that was attentive to this word today, Father God. I pray that you would help us, Father God, to heed the imperatives for Christian living. Help us, Father God, to be humble servants and help us to be a watchful soldier, Father God, because we know that there will be temptations on every hand, Father God, but for every temptation, you give us a way of escape. So, Lord, we just say thank you. We pray again that your word was edified on today, that it will be a blessing to someone in the weeks to come, Father God. Uh, again, we pray for safe travels home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, ladies. Thank you.